Um, well, it, it was, you, you know the, the myth of the, uh, you take the thorn out of the lion's paw <laughs> and you feel this gratitude, the lion feels this gratitude toward you. Um, Amazon rescued this project because it was, it was in limbo. It had been rejected by everybody for two years. Um, so the whole thing has been very happy from the beginning because they, they loved it and they funded it properly and they supported us creatively. Um, one of the many unique things about Amazon is that they put the pilot on their service for everyone to vote for. I'm used to doing pilots for broadcasters where no one sees it except for the executives mm -hmm. and then they decide whether it gets a series or not. So this was nerve-wracking because the whole world was going to see if they, you know, whether I failed or succeeded and whether they liked what I did or not. As it turned out, people liked the pilot very much and in fact it was the most popular mm -hmm. pilot they had ever done. So I liked very much the system <laughs> because <laughs> it worked. Um, what surprised me was because the public reacted so well, it made it easier to do the TV series. I think Amazon felt more comfortable spending the money on the series, and we were able to attract the best crew and, and best actors because people had seen the show and knew that it had been liked. I had read the book when I was in college wow. and it really made a deep impression on me. Um, and I think it was because I had seen so many TVs, TV series and movies where the good guys win. And in this novel, the good guys lost and they lost a long time ago. And it was about living in defeat. And that so troubled me and moved me that the book stayed with me. So Ridley Scott and, and David Zucker, who works for Ridley, had been the champions of this material for a very long time. And when I adapted it, he gave me total freedom to interpret the material as I saw fit. Um, and then when it came time to make it, I would say his principal role was as a visual advisor because he had a lot of thoughts about how it should be filmed, you know, how it should be lit, the compositions, and the production design in particular. And he pointed us to films like Blade Runner, not surprisingly, and The Conformist by Bertolucci, mm -hmm. um, as well as fine artists like Edward Hopper. And so I think when you watch the series, yeah. you can it's see Red those Kia. influences. Yeah. For me, this is an incredible time. It's the best time ever to be in television, to be making television, to be watching television. There has never been more good television being made or m more different types of television. And it's the first time in my career where they want you to be original. They want you to do something no one's ever done before. Because the market is so crowded, you need to do something to stand out. So it's, it's very challenging. The competition is intense, but it's very, very exciting. I think what's happened is the rise of all these new distribution platforms like Amazon and Netflix and cable television has been at the expense of the traditional networks. And so they're very eager to regain their audience and they're looking to their libraries quite cynically for names that will bring viewers back. In the case of the X-Files, I think it deserves to come back. I think The X-Files is such a wonderful idea, and I think David and Jillian um, 
embody those characters so perfectly, I never doubted it would come back. In fact, after the last movie, I, I said act, to, to the actors, I know this, this is not the end of this show, because the movie was disappointing, but I knew that, that they would come back somehow. And I still talk to the fans online. In fact, some of them are here today. Um, and I, I said, the last seven years, I said, don't give up. It's a line from the last movie, don't give up, it will come back. And I feel delighted that it's come back. I, I'm just sorry that I couldn't be a part of it this time. But as a fan, I, I can't wait to watch it. Believe it or not, X-Files was my very first job in television. And uh, I was just out of film school. So it was like my second film school. And I learned everything uh, from that experience. And I carry it with me every day. And I think about it, you know, in all of my work, I think about my time in the X-Files. And I was just incredibly fortunate to be a part of that show. Um, but, you know, I think what was perhaps unusual about the X-Files in the 1990s, you know, in, in that time of television history, was that Chris Carter's ambition was enormous. <coughs> and he felt you couldn't be smart enough, that your audience was always going to be smarter than you were. <laughs> and that isn't the way most people or many people thought at the time. So I've, I've carried those convictions with me. Um, right through Man in the High Castle. Um, I was very worried about that because I knew I had to change the novel. There was no way to make it into a television series unless I did. But Philip K. Dick's daughter, Issa Dick Hackett, is one of the producers of the series. And she approved of what I had done. And she read all the scripts and gave notes on all the scripts. And when she felt I was at odds with her father's ideas, she would tell me. Um, and we had some good arguments, because I didn't always agree with her. <laughs> but she's interpreting it just like I am. But um, uh, so far, most people who've seen the show um, understand the changes I've made and see why they were necessary, and see how, surprisingly, the TV series actually gives you more room to explore the ideas that are in the book. So when you're watching a TV series, to see a film, is so much more powerful than to hear about a book somebody has written. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting to me is the images we're showing you are images we've all seen our entire lives. You know, it's, it's newsreel footage from World War II. So it, it affects you, because we have those memories of the film ourselves. And then to see characters for whom that film is foreign, it's, it's a really interesting, powerful thing. Mm -hmm. Juliana and Frank, the boyfriend, they've already split. Uh. She's in Colorado and he's in San Francisco. So I, I went backward in time so they could still be a couple at the beginning and you could be concerned about their fate and worry about what would happen to them instead of beginning with them already split up. And, and then when I did that, I mean, to me, his Jewish but not Jewish identity, in other words, he's Jewish by ethnicity but not by faith, was so interesting that I felt I needed to dramatize that dilemma for him. So, yes, that's another one. There's, there's, there's many I could, if we had time, I could talk you through them all. <laughs>